this have access to like wireless mics that I can borrow? The venue for my event next week has no sound. Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana, and uh, we're taping today, so no call-in questions. But uh, I'm very happy to have Michelle Louise Bicking joining me again today. Uh, you might know that she was the Green Party's candidate for Congress uh, last November. And uh, we're going to talk about well, a lot of issues, but generally focusing on uh, the different aspects of hemp. And um, now we're seeing legislation in, in the state capitol uh, decriminalizing, legalizing uh, recreational as well as uh, medicinal cannabis. And we're also seeing some loosening of regulations for industrial hemp. And we're going to talk about maybe the right and the wrong way to do those things. <laughs> so welcome, Michelle. Thank you. Because I'm not at all convinced that the path the Connecticut legislature is taking is totally the right way to do it. Um, I, I have mixed, mixed impressions. Um, what I greatly appreciate is the route that has been taken for um, marijuana legalization, decriminalization, and, regularization and regulation in the state. Um, a lot of parties attached to CURE, the Connecticut uh, United for Reform Equity, um, there's a cannabis, a cannabis equity group that has been recently started under the le leadership of um, one of the members of CURE, one of the founding members of CURE, uh, that, that are doing a lot of work around making sure that it's like, accessible as possible to persons of color, uh, lower income, or I would say not, so not just lower income, but more, less established organizations that have uh, more regional or local clout versus you know, industrialized, uh, larger entities that are coming in from out of state to snatch up all and any opportunities to grow, um, and as well as process cannabis. Uh, yeah, I, and I think, you know, when Governor, you know, past Governor Malloy, mm -hmm. um, you know, medi medical marijuana came mm -hmm. into being during his administration, and I think for someone to start a retail operation, they needed to have a million dollars in escrow. Yes. That um, that really blocks a lot of people from that business. Quite a bit. <laughs> um, I mean, having that amount of money in escrow and then the application was like something like $75,000 up front. I mean, you know, very few parties could actually engage in that and it was, it was nightmarish, you know. So um, there's been a bit of a dance to try to figure out um, how it could be, the system could be more accommodating for people who are um, not able to put that much money up front, but at the same time can still deliver the quality product that folks deserve. Yeah. Now, you've been working a lot on the um, equity and, and growing mm. uh, through Hidden Acre, Acres Farm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the mission of, of your nonprofit work? And yeah, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Hidden Acres Farms is, you know, often referred to it as a three legged stool. Um, uh, one leg is focused on, you know, finding a piece of property that we can establish um, some organic produce and growing produce, not so much for profit, but more for um, giving away to uh, different community-based organizations, soup kitchens, churches, and the like, um, so we can just be a part of um, the fabric of food security in this state, um, in this region even. Uh, the second leg of the stool is around workforce development. That's a nice generic term. Um, speaks to our willingness to provide uh, workshops and other opportunities to network and learn about things that aren't often targeting people of color. Um, a lot of the agriculture related opportunities to gather um, are often focused on um, you know, intergenerational white male dominated um, industries and it doesn't really leave space for people who look like me and talk like me to have discussions about um, you know the basics like how do I set up a spreadsheet that you know allows me to com you know to, to document my progress over the last year you know in my own language you know um, so I've been keen on making it multicultural multilingual you know the different opportunities that I've uh, created together uh, for persons of color in this state um, as well as just generally accessible. So um, the third leg of the stool is industrial hemp legalization. Um, it's been a long process. Um, I'm very grateful to the incoming governor as well as the incoming ag commissioner 
uh, to make more of a priority, as well as the different representatives throughout the state who's helped write the, uh, the legislation. So as of about a week ago, you can actually apply for a license to grow industrial hemp for their, through their state's pilot program. Um, so we are well on our way in terms of how we get the process started, but we have not done, um, we being collectively the state as well as uh, people in my position, enough to speak to the equity, uh, making sure that it's uh, equitably available for women, for quote unquote minorities, and others. I know part of it really makes me crazy because mm. it doesn't make sense that growing industrial hemp was never uh, closed to anyone at any time. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a backyard garden and I can grow, you know, I can grow um, fox, uh, foxglove, I can grow mm -hmm. uh, poppies, <laughs> yes. I can grow all kinds of things that are poisonous mm -hmm. or that could be refined into uh, medicinal products that whose use should be controlled mm -hmm. and but in the plant state if it's not invasive or, or threatened to the you no know, a threat to the ecosystem right. we can grow it and industrial hemp is so benign compared to many things that are non-regulated unless you know you start refining it yeah. or selling it Absolutely. I mean, it's it's one of the um, I shouldn't say the few, but you know, it's 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 up there with um, plants where the whole plant is useful, from the flowers and the leaves to the stalk to the roots. Um, you know, it could be used for a multitude of, of of items in terms of you know food products such as the the whole hemp seed, hemp milk, hemp flour. Um, all of them, it's it's uh, gluten uh, gluten free and celiac sensitive uh, products that can be made. Um, it's just an amazing, amazing product. It, you know, it's often, it has been used recently to clean up brown fields. Um, uh, you know, it's a nitrogen fixing plant and it's just, it has just an amazing um, set of uses, the plant itself. So it's a shame that it got caught up in the whole reefer madness and got classified on schedule one as, um, as something that would be harmful um, to the populace. But I'm glad that um, certain wrongs, uh, at least that specific wrong has been corrected. And years. of course, well, I hate to be really a conspiracy theorist or <laughs> sound like one, <laughs> but um, at the time it became illegal, it is likely that the people promoting that uh, were going after the whole plant because mm -hmm. it was the paper industry, the paper industry and the synthetic fabric industry yes. that were doing a lot of the lobbying and the confusion between uh, psychoactive cannabis and industrial uh, hemp um, it seemed like the line was almost intentionally blurred mm -hmm. to catch a plant up in, you know, regulation uh, as a potentially dangerous substance. Agreed. Uh, to remove that level of competition in the paper industry and in the fabric industry. Right, and, and this even predates the plastics because hemp can be uh, converted into plastics, um, ecoplastics. And, you know, I, th I think about... Um, uh, all of the ways in which um, it was deliberately done to um, to keep their bottom lines in check, and it, it is quite shameful um, because it's the farmers that lost out. It's the smaller, you know, smaller operations that lost out in the midst of their uh, these organizations, their these industries' willingness to remove hemp from the uh, from the market. And you know, our systems actually have an uh, eco endocannabinoid. Forgive me, I'm pronouncing it wrong. But we, we are we are naturally <laughs> it's built. Early in the yeah, it's <laughs> early in the morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, or whenever you're listening, uh, you know our systems were meant to. We have a system that can accommodate hemp in, within us. So we actually, w in removing it from our diet, um, it, it makes me wonder what kind of complications have ar arisen from that. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of how our liver functions, our kidney functions, without um, having some form of hemp within us. So yeah. I know I've re fairly recently discovered, you know, using hemp seed mm -hmm. as a replacement for ground nuts in many yes. recipes because they're uh, much less prone to uh, cause allergies. Mm -hmm. And the first time I did it, I made that substitution because I didn't have ground almonds in my house. Um, I was bringing something to a potluck and there was a person there who said, oh good, I can eat it, I'm allergic to tree nuts. Ah. And so the substitution became permanent mm -hmm. because you know the finished product was just as good and its nutritive value was better yes. and uh, its 
you know, potential for, for you know, springing an allergy or an allergic reaction uh, was allergy. reduced. Yeah. So um, I've kind of become a believer in it as a useful cooking ingredient, even without thinking about uh, any of its other health attributes. Agreed. Um, I, th I think I had mentioned this the last time I had spoken with you regarding um, my son. Like, I did not introduce him to dairy um, after age one. I actually delayed um, introduction to dairy. But I did introduce him to, um, while breastfeeding, hemp milk. And he actually prefers that um, at age three more than cow's milk. Um, because just looking at the, you know, all the omegas and just all the benefits that are, that are within hemp milk, it was um, not even a substitution. It just seemed like the, the better route to take at the time. So. And it, well, it is interesting that around the world, uh, other than people of white European mm -hmm. heritage, mm -hmm. there are a lot of people out there who are allergic or sensitive to, to milk uh, unless it's fermented. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Agreed. You know, most of the world, people don't just drink milk. They might eat yogurt or kefir or some other or fermented cheese, yeah. or cheese, mm -hmm. some fermented pro mm -hmm. products, but. Um, there are a lot of people around the world who really can't handle just drinking milk. Yeah, and I, I think uh, folks of African descent particularly, um, you know, we struggle with being uh, lactose intolerant, and I think there's a reason for that. I had, I had an elder who um, had shared with me before, many years ago when I was um, in my teens, that uh, um, cow's milk is for baby cows. I mean, we were never meant to uh, drink the breast milk of another mammal, so, you know, we should be considering other ways to get that same nutritive base. Uh, within us, um, and you know, all the nut milks like the cashew, almond, um, even coconut milk um, are much better alternatives. Much better alternatives. Even though I have nothing against uh, cow's milk, I mean, I love yeah. um, whole milk from from a straight from the farm is the most delicious thing ever. Um, and unfortunately, in Connecticut, we can buy raw milk. Yes, yes, absolutely profound. <laughs> 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 um, but it's nice to mix it up and get you know get our beneficial nutrients from different sources. So now. You know, I, once again, I think about things a lot from the economic point of view. You know, mm -hmm. in New London, uh, so much of our economic development is based on, you know, building submarines or having a regional hospital mm -hmm. that, uh, that that sort of provides a hub for a lot of medical and, and pharmaceutical businesses. Mm -hmm. And to me, that doesn't look sustainable in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, for one thing, you know, building the subs. At some point, the federal government might decide we can't afford to do that, right. and it, it's a product that is not um, not really as useful as some things we could be building. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> so, uh, I, you had mentioned the different kinds of air, you know, industries that hemp could make an impact in, like mm -hmm. building or plastic. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe elaborate a little about how we could create manufacturing in our cities uh, around hemp? Absolutely. Um, just, just really briefly, the, the, the possibilities are quite endless. I mean, when you think about um, not just growing the industrial hemp, which was all of the rage in the last couple of years out west because it was finally getting um, the attention that it deserves in terms of its, its, its overall value, but you know, eventually they had learned after the first or second season that we have no, I, we have no where to place this. We have no processing um, um, facilities that we can, uh, you know, instead of manually taking apart or, or threading the the, um, the stalks, you know, how can we make this so that it can be stored more properly, that it can be converted into other products such as plastics or foodstuffs? Um, that has actually um, been very. Uh, um, very much on the horizon in terms of what we need to do. So, uh, you know, I'm imagining the possibilities of having processing facilities in state, perhaps in New London, um, in areas that were former manufacturing centers like Willimantic, um, you know, convert old mills into um, spaces where different products can be made, um, you know, from textiles to what, you know, anything that, um, that's uh, possible and needed and has a, like a good import or, or export base, rather, um, regionally as well as internationally. Um, I'm imagining that, you know, as we had mentioned before we started, <laughs> <laughs> instead of growing submarines, maybe we should be growing, um, growing uh, uh, railroad cars because that's also needed throughout the country. Throughout the country, we need uh, more uh, railroad cars and locomotive cars for not just like uh, um, transporting people, but transporting items from state to state. 
Um, there's just so many, you know, on the engineering aspect, we don't have um, proper uh, farming materials or farming equipment that can um, separate the different parts of the hemp um, into seed and flower and whatnot. You know, everything that's currently being used has been retrofitted from other um, wow. um, machines. There really isn't um, anything domestically that's that's appropriate. We often import from um, the UK and other, uh, I believe Canada as well, um, different parts of machinery. So that's that's a whole other realm that could be um, grown in the state as well. Well, and until very recently, the hemp itself was all imported from mm -hmm. Canada. From Canada, India, China, yeah, yeah. So that may change a little. But it's interesting when you mentioned the old factories, you know, there was a lot of, you know, small scale manufacturing mm -hmm. in Willimannock and New London in many of our East Coast company towns almost. Mm -hmm. And I see in many places a lot of old mills have been converted to apartments, you know, apartments or office spaces. But it does in some ways make sense to figure out what new manufacturing purpose for the 21st century it mm -hmm. can be fitted for. Absolutely, and you know, from that we can grow some really good, um, solid uh, blue collar jobs that have livable wages, uh, full benefits. And you know, when I was looking back at you know, all of the, I mean, it's an aside topic, but my understanding of how economies prosper is that if you focus, um, even as part of your energies, on the women and the female children uh, in an economy, you're more likely to have lasting results on whether um, the entire family is raised up out of poverty. So things that you know are reflective of a woman's needs in terms of um, contraception, access to contraception, um, access to uh, education, um, you know, all those different access to uh, quality foodstuffs within their area, uh, whether it's a food desert or a food swamp. Um, being able to get outside of that experience and and be able to to access you know whole foods that don't that, that aren't um, refined to to death, um, those are one of the fastest tracks in terms of, of long term economic um, stability uh, in a community. So I'm thinking about blue collar jobs. I'm thinking about women in particular that could benefit from um, not necessarily having to subsidize their income uh, or their lack of income on being on federal services like a SNAP program or whatnot, but actually be able to get that from the job that they're working. Um, if they decide to go back to school and say, hey, you know what, um, I want to learn how to do X. I want to be able to create this particular widget for this particular machine that I envision that would be more helpful in the fields for these farmers. So they go back and advance their education um, at low cost to no cost. That also is uh, a telltale signal of being able to bring um, the entire family unit out of poverty. So, I mean, there's so many ripple effects to be able to provide um, not just jobs, but careers for people um, that has lasting effects on how the state does overall. Now, one of your passions for many years has been getting women of color back into farming. Yes. Because, now, historically, there have been a lot of people of color, a lot of women of color mm -hmm. engaged in agriculture, mm -hmm. and it tapered off, I'm guessing probably because uh, they were, they've been excluded from owning the land they farmed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, how can we reverse that trend? Well, my, cl my clinical social work background comes into play um, in, in that respect more than I ever expected. Um, my understanding is that when I talk to women, uh, even my own mother, um, who grew up in uh, St. Vincent and the Grenadines in the 40s, um, where you, know, you were lucky if you had running water, and most people didn't. You had to walk, you know, several miles to get uh, water and carry water back on your um, on your head. Um, that farming was considered backwards. You know that instead of um, moving forward into like specific career tracks such as becoming a lawyer or a doctor, you know, no one thought of be going into farming as a viable um, career path. And it was actually indicative of, of seeming like you're backwards or too country oh. or not sophisticated. Um, the same kind of sentiment I've gotten with talking to people who are my age or younger, um, you know, in the 30s and 40s and late 20s, is that it doesn't seem like it's something that can actually create a livelihood um, for not just themselves but for their children. So, you know, when I think, you know, even further back in terms of how uh, persons of African descent were introduced to the land in this country, it was, you know, it was most often by force. And uh, we're, we were not allowed to grow things that we may have been accustomed to 
on mainland Africa from where, where West Africa or wherever we hailed or were taken from um, and came to this country with grains of seed of rice and other things braided in our hair um, and had to grow these things in private. So there's, there's some trauma there that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of connection to the land, and, and, not, and not just African descent, but um, Afro-Caribbean descent, um, Indo descent, um, even Chinese, the Chinese that were brought over here to work the railroads. I mean, just having the attachment to this land, um, um, land that is stolen by the, the, the many communities of, of First Nations, Native American people that were here, that needs to be repaired. Um, and but I think that, that that work is where I'm headed in terms of having, you know, not just taking away the stigma of being wanting to be a farmer or identify with farming, but having the understanding of ownership and belonging to this land that we are on. And it is interesting, you know, I've become involved over the last year or so with um, a, a new initiative for a community land trust yes. in Southeast Connecticut. Yes, great and stuff. one of the first uh, events we had at one of the local churches was uh, a screening of the short film Arc of Justice, which was about um, you know African American farmers trying to collectively own land to farm, mm -hmm. and it was it's been a bumpy road. <laughs> it started out uh, quite quite a long time ago mm -hmm. uh, in the 1950s, 60s. I don't mm -hmm. know, but it, it, it's it, it's definitely been a bumpy path. Yeah. Uh, even being able to keep the land uh, became hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think there are a lot of us who more than ever don't feel secure in even what we own. Agree. I, I, you know, I'm thinking about all of the um, farmers of late, you know, second, third, fourth, fifth generation farmers who are finding that, you know, again, folks who are um, my age or slightly younger are not willing to take up the baton to keep the farm in operation okay. because of the, the mounting costs um, for seed and for labor and for all of these different things. So, you know, keeping it within the family once the land has been acquired has also been very, very difficult. Um, so, you know, the one thing that, that, that a community trust would solve is that, that, that there's so many different willing hands to be able to caretake for those spaces. So, yeah, yeah. So one of, one of the paths. One uh, of the paths, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, you know, agriculture, too, since, I don't know, the 80s, certainly, maybe even before that, there's been, um, you know, in the United States, in many places, it's a trend towards huge farms being subsidized right. and family farms really not being subsidized. Mm -hmm. So um, there's not a le level playing field in terms of being able to, you know, compete. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's interesting that, that the, the majority of farmers that are actually, um, you know, just speaking of taking up the baton, um, are women I mean, in this country. That's where it's been trending. And they're often smaller operations that are making 15000 fi or to $50,000 a year or below. Um, so it's interesting that, that, that that's where the trend is. So I, I think that you know the Department of Agriculture on a, on, a, on a national level, as well as our local agencies, farm service agencies, need to be more mindful of who are who is being represented on these farms and, and making sure that their needs are being met. Because uh, you know even even in programming that's offered in the state by either one of those entities, um, it rarely targets urban farmers. It rarely targets um, communities that are closer to. to um, a city settings. It is often uh, in far-flung areas that people of color may not be able to reach. Um, and also at the same time, look, I am hosting an event next week um, on Friday, May 31st from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. in Tallinn, which is w right outside the quiet corner. Um, in the last couple of weeks, there hasn't been any kind of discussions for or that allow rural communities to be present around industrial hemp legalization. So it, it's it's it's, I, I'm not quite sure what is being done to rectify that, um, but it's interesting how that's happening as well as that the la there's a lack of resources directed towards people of color or people in general in more uh, urban settings. Well, you know, and it's interesting because uh, the show I did a couple nights ago live was with uh, the New London organization Fresh New London, yeah. which is a, an urban agricultural uh, advocacy group, mm -hmm. not just advocacy, but they practice, they have an urban farm, mm -hmm. they 
uh, try to engage uh, high school students uh, in agriculture. Right. And uh, they are finding, you know, especially, you know, girl, high school girls mm -hmm. who are very interested in, in farming. Are, are you finding that there's more interest now among, among women to run farms? Yes, to yes. To get back to the land? Um, it's, it's thrilling to see. I, I had a young lady who reached out to me. She's a social work major um, in her second year of grad school. And she's having a hard time um, finding opportunities that combines, com combines her interest in agroecology as well as clinical social work. And I told her, I said, you know, when I was looking for services for myself, when I started my organization, originally it was focused on people who had uh, self-harm, self-injury in their background. I couldn't find anything on an outpatient basis, so I had to become the thing that I was looking for. So, you know, she asked me to mentor her in, to become the thing that she's looking for, oh. which is an opportunity really to engage her skills, her skill sets, as well as be able to, you know, encourage other women um, um, to be more involved in what their community eats. So, you know, it's, it's been a fascinating turn of events. I, you know, it's as almost as if it's, it's, it's skipped a quarter of a generation, um, but I'm all there for it, especially uh, for young women of color to consider it as a, a proper vocation that can support all of their dreams. And I, I hope I'm not being too aspirational about it, but looking at it from a city zoning perspective, mm. um, in New London, uh, a couple years ago, we updated our plan of conservation and development, mm -hmm. and a section which had previously just had a couple of sentences about encouraging community gardens to start right. was, uh, thanks to Fresh New London, mm. uh, fleshed out quite a bit to encourage um, urban agriculture within the city. Mm -hmm. So our zoning regulations have not yet really caught up with that, but the 10-year plan uh, indicates that there is an interest in promoting urban agriculture within our five and a half square miles. And Excellent. other than the fact that it all has to be done in raised beds because all the right. land in New London, basically, and probably all of our old uh, urban centers have lead, have cadmium, mm -hmm. mercury, mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, industrial hemp could clear all of that because that's part of what the plant can offer. Um, it doesn't, it, I wouldn't say it sterilizes the ground, but it removes heavily metals from the soil. So, you know, it's interesting how that ties in with the possibilities of what um, New yeah. London could be, you know, the, the changing the, or evolving the identity of this place beyond submarines and um, services for uh, uh, um, uh, the regional yeah. healthcare center here. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, and, you know, when you mentioned uh, some of the uses of industrial hemp, you mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, as an ecological plastic, mm -hmm. the biodegradable plastic substitute. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, at both the state level and at local levels, we're seeing, uh, you know, proposals for bans of single-use plastics. Yes, yes. And there will be a market for products that are ecologically sound mm -hmm. to replace these single-use plastic bags. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're not going to Unfortunately, perhaps, but we're not going to get back to a time when there isn't any packaging. Right. I mean, there are some, you know, farms that have small farms that have their own uh, raise their own meat. I mean, the regulations are that they have to be sealed, yep. and so we're not going to be able to eliminate all plastic pa packaging. Mm -hmm. But if we can find better materials mm -hmm. that that won't pollute our oceans and yeah. You know, mm -hmm. kill our ocean life, and uh, um, it could be there could be a real market for this. Agreed. Um, uh, I think that's my word for the day. Agreed, because everything you're saying is just right on target, Rona, as always. Um, so <laughs> I'm just uh, you know thinking that you know I can imagine having a facility that focuses solely, uh, not solely, but one of the major products that they put forward is um, comparable products that are ecologically sound in in, in manner. Yeah that are not just compostable, but biodegradable within um, four months to five years. Um, and that could be anything from cans to 
um, you know, the plastic bags to um, even paper products, paper products, um, just an, an, an innumerable amount of things, innumerable amount of things that could be made that could be used in all, as an alternative to what's currently being used. Because I'm all for the styrofoam ban. I'm all for uh, single-use uh, products uh, being banned as well. Um, many countries like Costa Rica and um, other countries will be completely. Um, um, away from uh, using plastics, heavy, heavy plastics and, and non-biodegradable plastics within the next two years. So we need to catch up with what the rest of the world is trying to do in order to save our planet. Well, what I'm afraid I've, I've found, talking to very young people, people in their 20s and 30s or even like teens, mm -hmm. th there's a, a huge sense of urgency yes. to, to, to turn things around because they're looking at the world of their future. Yes. And unfortunately, most of the policymakers are more like my age and thinking, eh, it won't affect me, I'll be I'll be, I'll gone. be long <laughs> gone. Mm -hmm. um, and and it, it is really uh, troubling in a way, but it's encouraging to see the young people so enthusiastic and, mm -hmm. and committed to pushing the, these bans. Yes. You know, I think of the Sunrise Movement, and I think of all the different movements that are led by um, young people. You know, I, I believe there's an, a Native American say, a saying, and please forgive me if I say this wrong, but we inherit the, wor the earth from our children. Um, you know, I'm thinking about my, my three-year-old son, that if we continue on the path that we are in, in the next 15 years, he will not see his adulthood. Um, and I would miss out on grandchildren, which is tragic for me. Uh, <laughs> um, but you know, him not not being able to have a, a full life because of the decisions that generations before him have made is just is completely. It just it shouldn't be. It just shouldn't be. Um, so I think we have a unique opportunity to not just plant trees, but make lifestyle choices <clears throat> that will allow us to live more comfortably and live more in tune with the the, the patterns and cycles of our planet, as we should. As we should. And you know, I'm thinking about like all these different aspects of, of using hemp, you mm -hmm. know, building materials, mm -hmm. paper, plastic substitutes, uh, food right. industry, and you know, you mentioned uh, the issue of, of jobs and yes. well-paying, uh, uh, well-paying um, blue-collar jobs, mm -hmm. um, and honestly. I mean, it, it bothers me that blue collar is kind of considered a lower status <laughs> than white collar because right, always. very often the white collar stuff, if it went away, we could survive, but the blue, blue collar, collar we stuff, could not we, survive. We, we might not be able to survive. Agreed. But um, I think during periods of, uh, of this country's history where there has been a, an economic upsurge that's reached not just the upper one or two percent, but has really uplifted the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's been around uh, manufacturing jobs, um, which have had probably more successful unionizing in the past yes. than many types of, of industry. Yes. Um, that you know we're you know we're seeing an income gap that's really wide in Connecticut and getting. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in the country too, but I think Connecticut is one of the worst states of the union in, in terms uh, of, of the discrepancy. Mm -hmm. And you know, this could be a way to get, you know, get strike a balance between all yeah, of that. And get yeah, get the economy to, to reach out and lift people up. Um, I um, have mixed feelings about you know recent legislation that that went through. Uh, about the $15 wage, um, one, because it's not going to be rolled out immediately, it's rolled out over an extended period, and two, uh, $15 an hour is still not considered a livable wage. I mean, there's nowhere in this country, never mind this state, that you can afford a two-bedroom apartment for a family of four on $15 an hour. Um, so I'm thinking And not having just one job. And not just having one, more than one job and more than one income earner in that household. So, um, you know, even though I'm grateful that the effort was finally made, um, industries have been able to catch up with that. I mean, if it was, if, if the effort to push for $15 an hour went through years ago, perhaps it would have made a, uh, you know, even, even eight to 10 years ago, perhaps it would have made a, uh, more of a difference. But at this point, I'm not so certain. Um, you know, so I'm thinking in terms of if, you know, I'm using the words blue collar because that's, that's, that's part of our, our, our nostalgia in terms of how we refer to jobs in this country and careers. Um, and even in my own uh, background, it was, it was the push towards white-collar jobs and away from blue-collar jobs um, that was noted in my own family. 
Um, Mine too. <laughs> so yeah, you know, that's just that that was just the way we were raised. That's that was the expectation. Um, you didn't want to sweat every day <laughs> when you went to work. <laughs> um, so you know, in, in in an effort to 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 bridge that gap, you know, to be able to um, not necessarily have to have uh, four four years of college education in order to get a job that could pit, put food on the table, as well allow you some disposable income to do more things, um, travel, whatever your hearts can desire. Uh, is really, really palatable at this point, and I think it's very possible. I think the income gap is intentional. Um, I think it's part of, you know, you know, you had mentioned like conspiracy theories, but this is one of my own. Um, I think it's part of, of creating a system where very few benefit, and those are those who do not are completely um, uh, detached from any possibility of moving out of any kind of economic mobility. They're just stuck in that strata and are becoming like workhorses more than anything else, and they lose their humanity in the process. I think that's intentional. Um, however, every movement on this planet has been driven by people. Um, that's the one thing that has, people in mass, people who mobilize together uh, for the purpose, and that's one thing that has not been able to be um, quieted or dismissed. So if, if we as a people, whether it's on a local level or a national level, decide that it's not in our interest to live this way, then we can make those decisions. I read something yesterday that if every eligible voter who is a woman voted, we have the potential to change every single election in this country, every single election. And I'm sure that that's true even of uh, non-women who are under the age of 30. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because we we see that you know you know we're green so mm -hmm. we've all heard the you know the two percent your candidate got you know spoiled everything it's foolish but <laughs> i mean i want to see the 40 percent who don't feel as though voting makes a difference right. come to the polls because numbers like that could make a difference absolutely in the every one or two percent election. maybe maybe not maybe mm -hmm. in some in some states maybe that tips a very delicate balance, mm -hmm. but we know that the 30 or 40 percent of, of people who aren't even participating in the process, right. that would be revolutionary. Yes, and we need a revolution. We do. We're overdue for a revolution in this country. And one thing, and this is really off topic, Yay. but uh, but thinking about young people and, <laughs> and, and student debt, mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, you mentioned your conspiracy theory, and you know, when I was a student in the late 1960s, and we were uh, a pretty rowdy bunch of students then. Thank you. And um, yeah, I don't know how it worked out in the long run. We were, <laughs> I think we were good at some of the short-term changes, working towards more civil rights or mm -hmm. and a less rigid society. But I don't think we were good making long-range decisions to mm. make sure the, the, the world was a sustainable place because mm. maybe we thought the world wouldn't last that long. Mm. I don't know. Mm. But, um, but I think uh, having a crippling student debt yeah. is something else that is perhaps designed to keep students from getting too out of hand. Yes, yes. Um, because if you're worried about um, how are you going to pay your bills, including your student pay your loan payments, you're less likely to be on the picket line or, you know, um, volunteering to oust your, your local councilman that has been very corrupt or whatnot. Um, you're, you're, you're very much co confined to just being able to produce um, at that point. So, you know, I'm looking for candidates on, you know, in, you know upcoming presidential election that can, that is part of their platform that they're willing to consider um, and actively roll out a plan to reduce and eliminate uh, student debt for every last person in this country. Um, I know for a fact that my student debt has, has, has kept me from home ownership. Um, you know, I'm thinking in terms of how much money I'm saving for my son's uh, uh, future, in terms of if he decides to go to college or go into a vocational program. Um, it's been hampered by that. So I think that, that you know, being able to waive student debt uh, would profoundly affect uh, many young people, or even people who are in their 50s and 60s who are still paying, um, to allow them to prepare for the twilight years of their lives more comfortably um, would be an amazing, also, and also it's revolutionary thing. so things. much worse. I, um, so when Bob and I left college after two years, mm -hmm. we worked, I, I didn't have student debt. My parents were well off enough, they, they paid. Mm. Uh, Bob had student debt. We worked for one summer to pay off all the loans. Wow. 
And um, it wasn't the most exciting summer, but at the end of it, we were debt free. Mm -hmm. And then my, my kids are about your age, and they had some debt, but it wasn't, it wasn't staggering debt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I look at the people in their 20s now, unless they're from very affluent families, and the level of debt is incredible. Yeah. Um, you know, six figure debts coming out of four year college. colleges. Um, I was the first person born in this country and my family to go to college. Uh, so we had limited, there wasn't any kind of uh, proper career counseling. I went to Catholic school and there was really wasn't any space for that, which was shameful because then I would have had a better sense of how to uh, plan out the next couple of years of my life. So at age 18, when I had gotten some decent parcel scholarships from my undergrad, Denison University in Granville, Ohio, I went for it. Uh, if I had no, always hindsight is twenty twenty. If I had known then what I know now, I would have gone into community college taken all of my uh, core classes and then transferred into uh, a four-year college of my choice. So it would have re reduced a lot of the student, le le uh, student loan burden that I currently have. Because most of my, I have two masters and a bachelor's. So most of my undergrad loans are from my bachelor's degree, not even from my master's. Wow. Um, so, you know, I remember when I was working in residential a few months ago, a few weeks ago, one of the things I would impart to my young people is like, you know, please consider your options uh, in terms of how you approach um, higher education and remember that these loans will follow you as long as you have a social security number they're not going anywhere um, so consider you know what you're you're willing to take not just for yourself but for the generations that follow you whether you, if you decide to have children so yeah. that shouldn't be the case it really shouldn't it shouldn't there be should the case. be um, you know for I know that there's a federal program that would allow you like if you put in a certain amount of years of service in an area that is uh, financially depleted or considered high need or at risk, then your loans can be forgiven. So I would also look for whatever presidential can candidate wins whatever nomination um, in either party, including our own, the Green Party, um, if they're looking at, um, if they will consider first waiving all student debt, but would they also consider um, being able to work off the debt, like if you go into a particular area and commit to four to eight years of community service, that their, that their debt conveyor burden could be reduced. I mean, I'm also willing to consider that as well. One, because then you bring um, uh, professionals into high need areas, especially rural settings that may not have access to that or, or reservations that may not have clinical staff available. And two, you're also giving them um, the opportunity to, get to, to, to increase their purchase power when they, in the years to come after their, their um, service period is completed. So. Now thinking about equity in terms of uh, our economy mm. and, and the current you know, movement towards legalizing cannabis, right. uh, what do you think needs to be in any legislation, any new policies that would um, help undo the damage that's been done by the war on drugs and the war on industrial hemp? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I defer to the, to, to the great Jason Ortiz, who's been <laughs> uh, my beacon in terms of uh, he's shout been out to Jason. He's been in the, the show as many well. times. Yes, he's kept it warm. In fact, um, uh, in terms of what we need to do for um, you know reducing the effects, it will never be completely wiped out. The effects of the war on drugs in urban centers, which is also very much intentional. Um, I can speak to my what I would like to see in um, industrial hemp. Uh, in, in like in a parallel mm -hmm. universe because a lot of the, the when, when, when we speak about cannabis in the state of Connecticut we often focus on the marijuana um, aspect of it versus its cousin industrial hemp. I know that more efforts have been made as of late to include industrial hemp in the conversation however the, the, the legislation that has been drafted um, does not include industrial hemp at all. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, re regarding legalization, it's actually created on a separate track under the purview of the Department of Agriculture, who is finally taking the lead in terms of how we regulate uh, um, industrial hemp in this, in this state, as well as issuing licenses um, for the first time as of two weeks ago. So, but, you know, unlike what's been done, thankfully, by the many different groups mobilized on the issue for marijuana in this state, there is no equity um, or, you know, doors towards equity uh, and, and access in industrial hemp. There's mm -hmm. no um, saying of, okay, women-led or minority-led or however they're classified by, according to state regs and federal regs, would get the first few piloted licenses. 
before any other license. There was none of that. Oh. Um, so it's a first come, first serve. And there's no parameters in terms of when the license period will be closed. So for all I know, while I'm waiting for the opportunity to lease property, because that's a requirement for the license, you have to either have access to lease property or own your property outright. While I'm waiting for that to happen and making things, uh, pushing things happen along the way to make that happen, um, there are people who are ahead of me who already have access to farmland uh, who are getting those first few licenses. So the same, co the same consideration should be made in terms of what's being done for marijuana, for cannabis. You know, what are we done doing for um, even the training opportunities, not to bounce around, but even the, 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 the public convenings that talk about how to get into industrial hemp, how to get your license and all of that have not been focused nearly enough in areas that are highly concentrated by people of color. Um, in this state. So there's just so much to be done um, and I'm trying my best to uh, make sure that such things are discussed openly and um, make sure people are aware of all that's at stake in the months to come. Now you have a, some events coming up. Yeah. And I wanted you, <laughs> and I purposely wanted you to be on the show before those events so you, you can talk about them. Thank you. So what's in the works? So um, the, the first one is, and they're both happening on the same day, oddly enough. Um, the first one is a public convening that's happening in Tallinn, Connecticut at the Lodge in Crandall Park. And that's from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., as I had mentioned before. It's a forum that allows people to, who are interested in learning about industrial hemp as an agricultural commodity to be present and ask questions from um, different leaders from, from different parts of the experience. So we have Representative Pat uh, Theonis, who you know, is, covers our area, including Willington and other towns, who will be talking about her impressions of where we need to move forward legislatively. We'll be having Lupino, um, who will talk about his experiences within um, his business opportunities, because he straddles both working with marijuana and industrial hemp. Uh, we'll have some uh, leaders in terms of, you know, who have been out there in the field growing hemp for the past uh, two years so they can talk about their experience with actually rearing the crop. Um, so we hope to balance out those opportunities for people to actually ask some valid questions about, you know, how do I get into this market if I choose to? And how does Connecticut benefit as a whole, not just my town, but, you know, how does Connecticut benefit from uh, bringing back hemp to the fold? So. so if someone is interested in, like, signing up, how, how should they do it? Yeah, um, they can go online. It's HTTPS uh, colon backslash backslash <laughs> CTHemp, H-E-M-P dot eventbrite dot com. You can also Google the name of the event, which is called The Other Green Rush, a public forum on industrial hemp. Um, comes up readily in the search bar. Um, you know, again, when I, when I mentioned The Other Green Rush, the focus has been too much on marijuana, so we're talking about industrial hemp as The Other Green Rush. Uh, early in the day, there will be a Hemp 101 class that's being host at the, hosted at the Green Barn, at the Red, the Green Barn, the <laughs> Red Barn in Durham, <laughs> in Durham, Connecticut. It's a holistic center that has been very gracious in terms of allowing the space oh. to talk about hemp as food. You know, so you had mentioned, you know, putting it as an alternative to, to ground almonds in your smoothies. Yeah. Um, so I'll be talking about different ways to cook with hemp um, and um, having some samples available, including some hemp teas. So again, there's no hallucinogenic properties in hemp. Um, there's no um, pot potential of abuse or misuse with industrial hemp. Um, it's just the benefits, the nutritional benefits with therein that I'm trying to um, share with people so they can have a better understanding of what hemp is. And I'm thinking, you know, uh, Connecticut has a growing vegan population yes. too. So, um, you know, the, the search for nutrient-dense foods mm -hmm. is probably particularly strong among yes. that group. Yes, and so that this is where, um, you know, again, talking about industries, the people who are gluten sensitive or celiac disease or Crohn's um, will find, their, find that, that um, hemp in all of its forms um, is easily consumable and does not um, give any kind of uh, or nearly as much um, difficulties in, in for the body to, to process it. So. Now, is any hemp that grown in Connecticut for food purposes, or are we still like importing We eggs? are way behind. There is nothing, no value added products that are uh, made and packaged in, in Connecticut to date. And None. yet it could grow in Connecticut. Yet it can grow just fine. And, you know, in uh, a couple weeks, uh, I'm thinking green, we're going to have uh, our show, um, we do it almost annually before Juneteenth, mm -hmm. and um, usually our local our local NAACP partners with the uh, Connecticut 
I don't know, whatever the historic association is that, that uh, oversees the Hempstead House. Uh, yep. But, you know, we have a street in New London, Hempstead Street, mm -hmm. and the oldest building in, in New London is Hempstead House. What do they grow there? So, you know, Connecticut has a long history yes, of growing industrial hemp. Mm -hmm. That is something that there's no reason, I, I don't think, that we couldn't go back to it. I agree. This, this is one instance where going back to our roots, um, literally and figuratively, will be incredibly helpful for the future of this state. So, uh, looking so forward to it. Now, for the Durham event uh, related to cooking, mm -hmm. uh, how does a person find that one? Uh, we also have any, yeah, we have to register online for both events. Um, so, if you, again, if you go in your search bar and look for Hemp 101, It'll be at the Red Barn same on same day, Friday, uh, May 31st, from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. And all are welp welcome, especially children are welcome. So, yes. And now, um, Our Hidden Acres has a website. It has some information about the organization. Would you recommend people go to that? Absolutely. Or is there a better Absolutely. way for people to find out about the kinds <laughs> of things you're, you're doing? Absolutely. Please visit our website, um, Hidden Acres uh, Inc., um, we're at OurHiddenAcres.org. Uh, we're an incorporated uh, nonprofit that's been in Connecticut for the past six years, and we're always welcome to hearing from a community and, and learning more about how we can be of service to community members, especially within our, um, our area farms. Now, do you have kind of a wish list, or if people read it or have huh. watched this <laughs> and figure out this is an effort I'd like to support somehow? What kind of support can you know, can you use? Yes, we are in need of volunteers of all stripes um, to be present at different events, um, to, to participate in our board. Um, so we welcome any and, and any opportunities for any age, ages uh, from teens to um, whomever. Uh, we, we're, we're grateful for any kind of opportunities to connect with our, with our community. So. And what kind of volunteer work would people be in for? <laughs> <laughs> Anything yeah. of their heart's desire. You know, one thing about being uh, what, I, what I consider a small mom and pop or, uh, organization is that the need is great. So anything from your basic filing um, and sorting to going out to community events to doing outreach and marketing to updating the website to accommodate for different events that are coming up. Um, we need it all and we're grateful for it all. So. Now, um, and not so specifically for your organization, mm -hmm. we have just a couple minutes left, sure. but if people want to uh, get involved in advocating for this issue, for normalizing hemp as both a crop and an economic driver in mm -hmm. Connecticut, um, what ways can people do that? I highly recommend reaching out to your area representatives and letting them know that this is an issue of concern for you, that you want to learn more about how um, communities can get more involved in diversifying um, their, their, their tax base and whatnot. Um, I think that's one of the, the, the most helpful ways in terms of getting the word out there. I mean, uh, Representative Pat Bionius, I'm greatly f grateful, incredibly grateful for her, for her listening ear. Um, for her being present on the different caucuses and making sure that they're aware that industrial hemp is something that would be of great interest to the state. Um, so, you know, being able to connect with your legislators and letting them know that this is an issue of concern um, has been incredibly helpful. And being vocal, showing up at different um, events and letting them know, especially if they're ag-related, that this is something that is uh, of, of concern for you and would like to be more involved in seeing it rolled out on an equitable base basis in this state. And even New London being you know, a very dense mm -hmm. urban area, mm -hmm. You know, I was out in your neck of the woods yesterday, yes. and it has a very different feel to mm. it. But, you know, there are opportunities for, for agriculture on a very small scale, either yes. within New London or not far out, outside of its borders. So mm -hmm. it, it isn't just a rural Connecticut issue. It can be an urban Connecticut it issue could be, as well. Yes, absolutely. Um, industrial hemp has never been grown on a rooftop, to my knowledge, because um, <laughs> it needs pretty deep soil. Uh, but we can definitely be created with all the vacant lots. Um, again, industrial hemp, it, it, it does not require what we would consider pure soil. I mean, it could do the purifying as well, you know, as far as cleaning up the soil. Um, I wouldn't recommend using that first crop for the soil uh, for consumption. Yeah, but, uh, but <laughs> it could possibly be used for, um, 
for for not non consumption for non consumption uses, for purposes. Fiber, for yes. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. For plastics, I mean, there's other uses that we can use, um, especially in soils that are considered questionable. Um, we can convert them into things um, that people can be um, um, be able to use in other ways. So, absolutely. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, well, thank you, Michelle. Um, the other Green Rush is uh, an event coming up on the 31st, yes. as is Hemp 101. 101. Mm -hmm. People can find information about them online. Yes. And um, we will, um, you know, be in touch uh, more about it as things move forward in Connecticut. Absolutely. We'll have to get you back for an update yes. in like, I don't know, three or four months. Yes, yes. Well, yes. thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you, you know, at, I know I'll be at, at, at the uh, Tolland event, thank so you. I will see people there. Excellent. Thank you all.